morning, ladies. Good morning. Um, we are ready to study Matthew chapter 2 today, so before we get started, we will bow and have a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We praise you, O God, for being the great Almighty, for being totally pure, for being totally trustworthy, for being totally fair and righteous and faithful and for knowing all things and being all powerful, we praise your name. We worship you, God. We love you, God. We are thankful that you care about us, that you sent the word to come to this earth and become flesh and dwell among men, that he might be the perfect, sinless uh, Lamb of God that takes away our sins and washes us in his blood. We ask, God, that you would be with those of our number who have physical ailments, we pray, God, that you would be with those that we know of who are grieving over the loss of loved ones. We pray, God, that you would be with those who have been impacted with these two hurricanes. We ask, God, that you would be with them and help them with the physical uh, needs that they have, but also with the emotional uh, stress that's caused from losing their homes and from losing their families and all of that. We ask God that you will continue to be with our area as, as the workers are out uh, working on the power lines and cleaning up the brush. We pray God that you would help us to be patient with others, help us to love as we would like to be loved, help us God as we look to your word this day and, and we see where Jesus was born and is the King of all. Help us, God, to make him King of our lives and to be like him as much as possible. We thank you for your word that that it is here with us, that it's readily available, and that, God, we can look at your word and learn about you and learn about Jesus and learn about your church and be guided in our lives. We're so blessed. Help us to never forget how blessed we are. And thank you, God, for this beautiful day and for the cooler air that is so invigorating. And thank you, God, for giving every blessing to us while we live on this earth that you have given. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we're ready for chapter two. So let us just read... Uh, verse 1 through verse 12, um, just to get us acclimated to what we're going to be studying. So um, we'll each read about three verses. We'll start with Lynn and go around the table. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem to say, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this, thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of these shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Okay, so the themes in this chapter, Jesus is the true king of the Jews, and he is worthy of worship. Now, if you recall, 
um, we talked about last week what the whole book of Matthew was about and who it was written to. Who was it written to? The Jews. The Jews. And what was the purpose? To show them that he has come to fulfill the prophecies of old. Very good. And all through the book, it talks about it has been written or it has thus been fulfilled. We, we talked about the use of those words um, in Matthew. So um, keep in mind that this second chapter is about Jesus being the true king of the Jews and he is worthy of worship, okay? All right, verse one. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Who was Herod? This was Herod the Great. Herod the Great did not become king because of ancestry, um, because his father was king or anything like that. Julius Caesar had appointed Herod the Great as governor over Judea. His reign lasted from 37 BC to 4 BC. He died when he was about 70 years old. He had great building programs during his reign. He had much political intrigue. He had many assassinations and he was known for his cruelty. So this is the atmosphere in which Jesus was born. All right. Who were the Magi? Um, that's always an interesting thing to consider. Um, the Magi are associated with astronomy, astrology, and soothsaying. And if you look at the word M-A-G-I, what do you what do you Magic. automatically think of? Magic. Magic. So we get our word magic from the Magi. Their origin is a mystery because from the east, in verse 1, is very vague and indefinite. Um, but historians believe that they may be part of a priestly class among the Medes. So this brings up the question of were they Gentiles or were they Jews? Now, we can't rightly say. Um, um, most people consider that they were Gentiles, okay? Um, but, you know, it's not certain. Um, sometimes this word magi is used to describe men who advised monarchs. For example, Daniel. And if you'll put a marker in your Bible at Matthew 2 and turn with me to Daniel 2. You remember that Daniel was one of the young men that was taken um, in the Babylonian exile. He was taken and he uh, was an advisor to the king. If you'll recall, he, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were uh, some of the young men that were um, given special attention, special food, taught the language, uh, given Babylonian names, that kind of thing. But you recall that Daniel refused to eat that special food, didn't he? And then you recall that King Nebuchadnezzar was the king during the time of the Babylonian exile, and he was a ruthless man, and he had a dream. And he called all of his magicians and his counselors, look in uh, verse 2. What chapter? Chapter 2, verse 2, he gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell him his dream. And if you recall also, he did not tell these people what his dream was. He expected them to tell him what the dream was and also to interpret it. And I think he did this to make sure that they were truthful and honest with him. They were not able to do that. And so someone said, well, we know of one of the uh, uh, exiles from Judah that can tell you the dream, and his name is Daniel. So look with me, um, especially 
in verse 27. We know that Daniel was able to interpret the dream, but look what Daniel says in verse 27. I just thought this was special to note this because Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And I just thought that was something that I wanted to note um, in our study today, that God in heaven is the one who revealed uh, to Daniel what the king's dream was and what it meant. Uh, men are not able to do that, but God in heaven. All right, so magi, sometimes this word is used to describe men who advise monarchs, just like Daniel, the example we have of Daniel. Um, we also know that Jews were taken to Babylon, like we just read about Daniel, and also to Assyria. Remember, both of the exiles, the northern kingdom was taken under Assyrian captivity, the southern kingdom under Babylonian captivity. Um, and so we had Jews outside the land of Judah, the land of Israel, okay? Outside of these areas where God had planted them after um, they exited Egypt, okay? And then also on Pentecost, we notice that there were Jews from all over the place. So if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 2, we'll look at verse 5 and verse 9. Acts chapter 2. Brenda, read that for us, please. Parthian, Parthians? No, verse 5. Oh, 5, excuse me. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And uh, Miss Linda, verse 9. Verse 9. Mm -hmm. Parthians and Medes and the, the Lamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia. Okay, so there were Jews, devout men from every nation, and verse 9 even mentions Medes. So if we believe that the Magi were Medes, they could have been proselytes. What are proselytes? Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. Or they could have been Jews that were there from being exiled um, because this says Jews in verse 5, okay? Um, so we don't know if the Magi were Gentiles or if they were Jews. That's the whole crux of it. We just really don't know. And I suppose in the whole scheme of things, it's not important for us to know or else God's Word would have revealed that to us. They brought three gifts, frankincense, myrrh, and gold. So, typically, um, the world considers that there were three magi. But just because they brought three gifts does not mean that there were three magi. There could have been a whole group of them. For that matter, there could have been two. You know, it does, we're not told. Um, so when you see the scenes of the three wise men around the stable just recognize that we don't know how many men there were. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. All right. They were obviously aware of a prophecy, but they were unaware, a prophecy of a king, but they were unaware of the prophecy of where he would be born. So we're back in Matthew chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So they knew there was a prophecy about a king of the Jews, but they did not know where it would be. Um, Micah 
chapter 5 and verse 2 actually is the prophecy of where Jesus would be born. And um, that is uh, quoted for us in verse 6. Okay? Um, there is a question. Oh, before I move on, I want to say... Um, they, they spoke to Herod, and they called this baby King of the Jews. Now, Herod, as we already noted, had been made a king by Julius Caesar. He was not born a king. He did not come by his kingship through lineage and birth. And so, this bothered him about a king of the Jews. And this goes back to our theme that Jesus is the true king. This baby is born the king, a king, okay? Um, whereas Herod was made king, this baby, this man is born a king. Okay. Um. The Jews, pardon me, the Magi obviously would have thought a king would be born in the capital city. And that's probably why they came to Jerusalem and went to King Herod to inquire where the new king was born. Okay? Um, the Magi said, we have seen his star in the east, and um, we have come to, for what purpose? Look at verse 2. What was their purpose in coming? To worship him. To worship him. If they were Jews or Jewish proselytes, maybe they had some knowledge of the prophecies about Jesus, but not all. We can't know for sure. If they were the Gentiles, and they had just seen the star, and they had come to worship Jesus. Maybe that's just a foretaste, a foretelling of how Jesus was going to be the king of Gentiles and Jews, the king of all peoples, that he was sent to all people. Okay. Um, worship. What is, the me what is the meaning of the word worship? The meaning... The exact meaning is to kiss toward, to prostrate at the feet of. So when you worship God, you fall at his feet. Mentally, uh, a few years ago, I decided that when I prayed, I would vision in my mind a big throne, and I would vision myself falling on my face, being prostrate on the ground in front of that throne um, because when we pray we are going to God's throne and we need to go with reverence and humility and I would even vision so example I'm dressed in this shirt and these black pants I would even envision myself dressed as I am falling before that throne prostrate before the throne means to Get low on the ground at the feet of that person. All right. Um, if you look in verse 3, we read, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. What well, makes sense why Herod was troubled? We already referenced that because this was a king born a king. Herod was only made a king. We already saw how Herod was ruthless in his reign, how he was worried about other people, so he had other people assassinated. And so, of course, he was worried, but why would Jerusalem be worried also? Maybe because they figured if he was, if Herod was upset, then he would be worse for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's it. If Herod was upset, or at least that's the way I understand it. If Herod was upset, what could they expect from him? You know, when you've been personally 
uh, around someone who is kind of gruff and kind of mean, or maybe they're not that way all the time, but they're angry. What do you do? You try to tread lightly. You try to be as inconspicuous as you can be, kind of like, I don't want the attention drawn on me. You know, I want to just kind of, you know, avoid this person or whatever. To me, that's the feeling I get here that Jerusalem also was upset because if Herod was upset, they knew what he was capable of. They knew what kind of king he was and what might happen because of this. I think it's interesting that all of Jerusalem were aware of the Magi coming, were aware of them talking to Herod. I don't know how the news got out, except for the fact that Herod gathered all the chief priests, if you look in verse 4, and the scribes of the people, and he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Maybe that's the way the news got out so that all Jerusalem was upset. I don't, I don't know. But he inquired of them, and then verse 5, they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. All right, so he called the scribes and the chief priests and asked them, of all the people who should have known the prophecy, it was these people, the religious leaders. The scribes took the words that were written and wrote them down, and wrote them down, and wrote them down. So obviously they should be the ones who would have known. And I am wondering, because we know that Jesus was only 30-something when he was crucified. I'm wondering if some of these same scribes and chief priests were still alive when Jesus walked as a young man on the earth. And if they were some of the ones... And if they were some of the ones that rejected him, you know, I don't know, but I just couldn't help but wonder. Okay, so they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, verse 5, for this is what has been written by the prophet. We already mentioned that this prophet is uh, Micah. Um, and also... Um, we talked about how Herod was worried because this was a king, born a king. Herod obviously didn't understand the prophecy any better than the Jewish people. He thought that Jesus' kingship would be earthly and that his kingdom would be <coughs> earthly and that he would cause a revolt, you know. Um, and obviously that's misunderstood by the Jews that's why they didn't want to accept him, because they wanted someone to come in and take them from under Roman control. They thought he would release them in a physical way from their oppressors, not in a spiritual way. Um, so um, they, the scribes and the Pharisees quoted Micah and told told the king that Bethlehem was where Jesus would be born. Verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So verse 7, Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Now why would he do that? So he'd know about how long the baby had been alive. Right, exactly. What do you read, uh, what do you think about when you read Herod secretly inquired of the Magi? He probably didn't want them to get word that he knew and, and leave. Well. And also to. I thought about how, what type of man he was and how most evil deeds are done in secret or in darkness cover of darkness in secret, you know? Um, you do something that you know is wrong, that you know is shameful, and do you do it out in the open for everybody to see? No, you do it in secret. Or in the cover of darkness, shall we say. So we want to look at Ephesians 5, 11 through 13.
Ephesians 5, 11 through 13. I'm going to get there. Ephesians 5, 11 through 13 reads, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. And I want you to think about one of the names that Jesus is given that's descriptive of him. Light of the world. Light of the world. Um, so Herod came and secretly asked the Magi about Jesus who would be the light of the world. Who would bring all secret things into the open. And we know that even if we do secret things, there is still one that sees, the one in heaven. And we know that on the day of judgment, all the secret things will be exposed. Okay. Um, chapter 2 in Matthew, verses 8 and 9. And so Herod sent the Magi to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them, until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. The star. So the star had guided them from the east all the way to Jerusalem. They inquired in Jerusalem where the baby would be born. They were told in Bethlehem. And when they started on their journey, guess what? The star appeared again. The star actually went all the way to Bethlehem and appeared over the place where baby Jesus was. And they rejoiced greatly. Now, a lot of people who don't believe in God, who don't believe in the Bible, who would like to whittle away at your faith and cause you to fall away, would say that this star was just a natural thing that appeared many years ago. Like it was a special meteor or a special blah, blah, blah. But we see that this was miraculous. This was a guiding light for these men that God put up there specifically to guide them to baby Jesus. Yes, ma'am. God created the world. He says it was a star. Actually, if you look in verse 9, it says the star. See, after hearing the king, they went on their way and the star. And then you look in verse 10, when they saw the star, okay? When you look in verse 2, his star. So it was a very specific star. It was not just something um, that was up there naturally that they just hadn't noticed before. It was specific. So your point is well made, Miss Brenda. Okay. Um, all right. Verse 11. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Okay. Um, we already talked about the three types of gifts and how it doesn't mean that there were only three men. But I do want to to show you in this commentary. I want to read a little bit about what those uh, gifts were. This is the Truth for the Day for Today commentary um, on Matthew 1 through 13. Um, Sellers S. Crane Jr. Um, and the general editor is Eddie Cloer. Um, and I've been looking at this some in my study. On page 67, it talks about the three gifts. The three gifts consisted of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
Gold was a gift commonly given to kings. Frankincense, a word literally meaning pure incense, was a resin or gum extracted from the bark of a tree of the genus Boswellia, which commonly grew on the limestone rocks of southern Arabia. Because of its sweet and fragrant smell when burned, it was offered to worship in God, uh, to worship to God. Uh, and he gives a few um, scriptures, Exodus 30, verse 8, 34 through verse 38. It had other uses, such as making an embalming fluid, and fumigation, and as a base in some medicines. Myrrh was a resin or gum which may have come from the balsamodendron tree, which also grew in Arabia. This gum made an aromatic perfume which was sometimes used to scent beds or garments. It was an ingredient in some kinds of incense and served as an anointing oil, including what was used for anointing bodies of the deceased. When mixed with wine, it was also used as an anesthetic. You remember uh, when Jesus was hanging on the cross? They, somebody offered him a drink to be an anesthetic, and he refused it. Lewis said that while myrrh and frankincense are not costly today, these substances were very expensive in the time of Christ. So that discusses the things that they um, sent to Jesus. These were very costly things. Now, you notice that a lot was made of the fact that they were aromatic and that they were used um, as fumigators or perfumes or whatever. You think about um, the lives that they lived and how maybe they didn't have the conveniences that we have and they didn't wash as much. Now, Jews typically did wash. They were very clean people because God had told them, and, and that's why they did, but as a rule, we don't know how, I don't know how much the Romans washed or whatever, um, and I was brought to mind, I had a patient in the office recently that said during the uh, power outage that um, this person had bathed with these uh, towelette things and then had bought some kind of a spray, an all-over spray that you could spray all over. And, and this person said, you know, when I had to go and be around people, I sprayed all over. Well, this is what I'm reminded of when I read about some of these um, gifts that were, were given to Jesus. I also want to mention that verse 11 says, After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. Now go back again to what we usually see at Christmas time, and we see three wise men, and where are they? Standing to, like at the foot of Jesus' cradle. Which was in a? Manger. Stable. A manger. Right. A manger. Right. So we usually see three wise men standing there, looking at the baby while he's in the manger, which is in a stable. What does this say? In a house. In a house. Um, turn with me now to Luke 2, 21 through 24. Luke 2, 21 through 24. So we know in Luke, we also have the birth of Jesus um, written out. And if you look at verse 21, you will see... And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So this is what um, Jesus' parents were doing. You know, after a woman had a baby, she was required to go and offer sacrifices, girl or male. Um, and um, verse 24 says, And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So if you go back to Exodus, you will see that lambs were typically offered, but for the poor people, they could offer 
this two turtle doves or two young or young pigeons, two young pigeons. And that was for the poor people. So the reason I'm bringing this out is because when the Magi came to Jesus and his parents, they brought gold, frankincense and myrrh, which were costly, expensive. If the Magi had seen Jesus before they went and offered their sacrifice, they could have afforded a lamb. They were no longer poor. But because the scripture says that they offered the sacrifice that the poor people offered, we would then assume that this was before the Magi came and gave them these gifts, these costly, expensive gifts. So that tells us that it was a little while, and it says after eight days passed before his circumcision, it tells us that at least this amount of time has passed before the Magi are led to where Jesus was. And at the point where the Magi saw him, he was in a house. Um, as we see in Matthew chapter 2. Um, and then the very last verse of the part that we've already read was verse 12. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Okay? And so the Magi, for some reason, decided that they would obey God. They were warned in a dream. Does this maybe lend credence to the fact that they were Jews? I don't know. We, we, you know, we don't know. But they at least obeyed what they, re what they uh, had in a dream, what they were told in a dream. And they went a different route and did not go back to Herod and tell him where the baby was born. All right. Um, so verse 13, we're going to begin here with verse 13. <clears throat> now, when they had gone, the Magi had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Verse 14, So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt, I call my son. All right, so we see in verse 13 that once again God spoke to Joseph in a dream. Now, had God spoken to Joseph in a dream before? Yes. Yes. Miss Linda, when was it? Oh, when he was a spouse to Mary. When he was a spouse to Mary and she was found with child. And we talked about this last week. What kind of person was Joseph? Did he did he obey right away or did he him haul around about it and question? He obeyed, he obeyed right away. And we see that he, in verse 14, got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. Sounds to me like he had this dream in the beginning of the night. After he had the dream, he woke up and he said, hey, let's get all of our stuff together and we're leaving right now. That's the way I read it. I don't know if that's exactly the way it happened, but he did it during the night. Once again, the night, we do things during the night to hide what we're doing. Here, this was not a bad thing, but he obviously was trying to be more cautious and do this not during the day when Herod could see. <laughs> okay? Um, and he went to Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod, we see in verse 15. Now, according to the commentary, that may have only been a few months while he was in Egypt. And they have been able to determine when Herod died and what time of the year it was and, and this and that. And, and it may have only been a couple of months, which is interesting to me um, because if you just read it as a lay person um, and you don't, you're not a historian and whatever, you don't know how much time. You think, well, maybe he was two or three years old or whatever. But, but 
but they have they have pinpointed it down to spe specific time and think maybe it was only a few months. Now the interesting thing that I like about this and that I want us to look at is the fact that verse 15 says, um, he remained there until the death of Herod to fulfill what had been spoken. There's that theme that we see in Matthew to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt, I call my son. Turn with me to Hosea 11 and verse 1. Hosea 11 and verse 1. Okay, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. 11, verse 1, which reads, When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Okay? Um, where did... Um, well, let me say, when this was when this was prophesied, this was almost like a dual prophecy. Um, well, not a dual prophecy, but um, it it looked backward to the children of Israel, and they were in bondage in Egypt, right? You know, you remember Joseph brought all of his family to Egypt and saved them through the famine. And they lived there, and they prospered, and eventually there was a ruler who didn't remember Joseph, and he took them into bondage and made them slaves. He killed, he killed all the babies, the men babies, the, the boy babies. We're going to see how that's kind of similar to what Herod does. But, and eventually they cried out to God, and God sent Moses, and Moses led the people out of Egypt. This is what this is in Hosea referring to when he said, When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But Matthew uses this as a prophecy of Jesus. And so we have like the type and anti-type here. Okay? The type is Israel being freed from Egyptian bondage. The anti-type, anti means no or not, but the real thing, the anti-type is the real thing, is Jesus being called out of Egypt. So he had to flee to Egypt while Herod was alive, and then when Herod died, which we'll study that next week, um, God told him that Herod was dead to go back to the land of Israel. Okay, so out of Egypt he was called. So um, this is connected with each other. I think that is so interesting. Um, that's not something I would have normally picked up on. Um, and so I'm happy that there are people who are smarter than me that can connect those dots. But we see all through the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus. And uh, here, Matthew specifically tells us, and we know that Matthew wrote by the Holy Spirit, that this was a prophecy of Jesus, that Jesus had to flee to Egypt to be safe while Herod was alive. And once Herod died, he was called out of Egypt in a dream to, to Joseph. And that's where we're going to stop, and next week we will finish chapter 2 and probably get into chapter 3. So I appreciate your um, being here today and your um, attention in our study, and I'll see you the next time.